I call this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board. Today is Monday, April 10th, 2023, and the time is 6 p.m. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The recording of this meeting will be posted on the district website as soon as possible. Welcome members of the community here tonight to observe the important work being done on behalf of all school district stakeholders. Dr. Hillman, we have some items in the table file. Will you update us? Yes, we have several items in the table file today. We have uh, several appointments. We have increased, decrease, and change in assignment. Uh, we have a leave of a couple of leaves of absences. Uh, so we have retirements, resignations, and terminations. We have a couple of grant applications. And I just do want to point out too that um, we had inadvertently in the minutes from the special board meeting said that the location had been the district office boardroom, uh, when in actuality it was, of course, the middle school. So we just want people to be aware of that as part of the table file as well. Very good. If there are no objections, we will add these items to the agenda as we move forward. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Moved by Jeff. Is there a second? Moved by Amy. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. We're now on to the public comment portion of our meeting. Anita, is there anybody signed up? No? Okay. Okay, item four is announcements and recognitions. Dr. Hellman, do you have anything for us? I do have one announcement this evening. We want to congratulate uh, Director uh, Daryl Keller and the Area Learning Center staff. Their practice uh, called the Wednesday Schedule was selected as a 2023 Minnesota Promising Practice Award by the Synergy and Leadership Exchange. Uh, the ALC is recognized for implementing practices that promote character development among students, staff, and the school community. Uh, this was accomplished with Wednesday's schedule. Uh, the ALC operates a slightly different schedule on Wednesdays where uh, students sign up that day for experiential learning opportunities such as Youth Build, a program that you've heard about before, cooking, flower arrangement, knitting, and many other opportunities. And the ALC will be celebrated for this achievement at the Character Recognitions Award Luncheon on Tuesday, May 16th uh, at St. Mary's University's Center in Minneapolis. So uh, again, our area learning center is often innovative and doing some creative kinds of things. This is not the first time that they've been recognized with one of the Synergy and Leadership Exchange Promising Practice Awards. And so we congratulate Daryl and uh, the entire team at the ALC for earning this honor. That is the announcement that I have tonight. Very good. Okay, um, are there any other announcements from the board members. If not, Amy and I would like to um, share some comments and present um, Dr. Hemman with the plaques that he's already been presented with, but not in front of the board. Uh -huh. So we wanted to um, <laughs> make that presentation in front of the board. Okay, great. And I will read um, the comments that were made at that presentation. Um, and Dr. Hemman, who, um, uh, who made these comments? I don't have that note. Uh, would have been Dr. Deb Henton, the director of MASA. Okay. MASA. From the uh, Minnesota Associ Association of School Administrators. So here are the comments that were made that day. Each October, we are fortunate to announce the recipient of the Minnesota Superintendent of the Year Award. Nominees are considered based upon their demonstration of leadership for learning, communication skills, professionalism, and community involvement. We are grateful to ATS and our planners, architects, engineers for their ongoing support of the Minnesota Superintendent of the Year program. We are pleased to honor our 2023 Minnesota Superintendent of the Year, Dr. Matt Hillman, Superintendent of Northfield Public Schools, and one of our four finalists for National Superintendent of the Year. As the Minnesota honoree, Matt was also honored during the, this year's AASA convention in San Antonio. Dr. Hillman started his career as a computer education teacher and technology coordinator with Medelia Public Schools and served as a technology coordinator, dean, and principal with Belle Plaine Public Schools. He has served as a superintendent of Northfield Public Schools since 2016, previously leading as their director of administrative services and director of human resources and technology. Currently, Matt also serves as our associate our association as MASA board chair and was a graduate of the first MASA Aspiring Superintendents Academy. We're so proud of Matt's work, his leadership and his commitment to all children. In a recent MSBA publication, Matt was quoted as saying, educational equity means enduring, 
ensuring every student has a genuinely fair chance to achieve their version of the American dream. We have to acknowledge that some segments of society have not always been given a genuinely fair chance. Equity is essential in schools because it also, it is about giving students real opportunities. You can see why I have repeatedly said um, that Matt is a fierce leader and advocate for equity and student achievement, not only within his district, but also across the entire state. If you ever have the opportunity to work with Dr. Hillman, you will quickly learn that his top priority is the well-being and success of all students and families. Congratulations. Thank you. We're so very proud of you, Matt. Yeah, so the, uh, the bronze award is from the State Superintendent of the Year Award. And then the silver award uh, is the one for the National Superintendent of the Year finalist, one of four in the country. An incredible achievement. It's been Congratulations. quite an honor. It's a delight to serve all of you. It's great to do it here. We're very so, proud of you. Thank you. And later this week, in fact, there's a public celebration. Yes, on Thursday from 4 to 6.30 p.m. at Northfield Middle School, everyone's invited. There will be um, MASA is sponsoring that, um, that celebration. And uh, Willie Jett, the Commissioner of Education, and several other people uh, will be speaking at it. And we invite you. There's MASA is sponsoring it. So we have some cupcakes and cookies and lemonade for people to enjoy. And it's from 4 to 6.30 p.m. and a short program at 5 p.m. So I hope people can come and celebrate. Very good. Thank you. Okay, item five are our items for discussion and reports. First, we have the proposed 2023-24 internal service bud fund budget and Director of Finance Val Murdisdorf will present, um, will make this presentation. The board will be asked to adopt the adopt the budget at the May 22nd board meeting. Come Val. Thank you, good evening. I am gonna talk a little bit about the internal service fund budget, uh, which is our self-insured health and dental plan budget. It is a separate fund. It's reported separately on our financial statements as considered a proprietary fund for financial reporting purposes. Um, so we have been self-insured with our dental program since fiscal year 06 and our health insurance we switched in September of 2011. So for the fiscal year 12, school year. Uh, the revenue for this fund is the premiums that the district contributes to health and dental, the premiums the employees contribute, as well as some of the retirees that have ongoing benefits. Some of that's paid by the district and some of that is paid by the retiree. And expenditures reflect uh, all the actual claims that are paid and um, an administrative fee for uh, Medica and Delta Dental to manage and administer the program on our behalf. Our current stop loss, which I'll talk a little bit about throughout the presentation, um, you'll also hear it referred to as reinsurance, is at $125,000 per member. So I'll start with dental. Um, the dental fund is super stable. Um, it's actually pretty impressive that we have never, never <laughs> increased the rates in our dental fund. We have actually decreased them temporarily because we had too much fund balance at one point and gave what uh, is affectionately known as a premium holiday. Um, we have never had to increase since fiscal year 06. Um, so I think that's pretty impressive. We've had pretty stable enrollment stable claims. Um, this is obviously a much different uh, financial situation than the health insurance, just on a scale, but overall it's been incredibly successful for the district. We did see um, a little bit of a decline in enrollment, but not significantly. Uh, we're about six, 614 uh, employees that participate in this program. And as you can see, the monthly premium has been the same for quite a while. Financially, again, it's very stable. Um, so you can see on the bottom there, the goal for both our health and dental insurance funds um, on our financial statements, they are presented together in one statement. Um, however, for financial tracking purposes, we do have separate funds for them to keep track of each of the individual revenue and expenditures and fund balances. 
And so our goal for both of those is to have 40% of our um, expenditure claims available at the end of any given year. Um, that is best practice according to our consultant, One Digital, across the industry. So charges for services is again the premiums. So about 647,000 is what we're projecting for next year. Interest earnings, um, we're still projecting that to be pretty minimal at this point, but that can change depending on uh, the situation we have with our financial investments. And then insurance claims, again, is just all of the claims that people are submitting for going to their dental appointments, having dental work done. And then the administra administrative fee is what we pay to Delta Dental. So total expenditures of about 732000 and we are expecting our fund balance to be about 331,879. You'll notice that's above the fund balance goal, but if you, you'll notice it is trending down. I do anticipate just with medical inflation and the fact that we haven't ever increased our uh, premiums that we will likely have to start doing this incrementally, um, probably in the near future, because we don't want to be in a situation where we're dipping below that or running up against something that was unexpected. So we'll do that in a um, reasonable um, incremental way moving forward. I don't know if it'll be next year, um, but probably for sure the year after that. So the health insurance fund, again, saw a slight decline in the participation. So we're about 482 employees participating in this. 482 is the employee count. Um, it is not the actual covered member count. So we have probably just over a thousand um, people that are covered by our health insurance plan. 482 actual policyholders, if that makes sense. So the monthly premium, um, as you know, we've talked a lot about our health insurance plan over the last 18 months or so. And you can see from the 22 fiscal year to 23, uh, we took a pretty substantial uh, increase, about 25%. And then for 23, 24, um, for reference, our plan year is January 1 to December 31. So our fiscal years don't line up perfectly with this, but for uh, budget purposes, I use the fiscal year because that's where we're at. And so we did in January take another 10.5% increase on the premium. And so for January now, as of January 1, the 2324 rates are what's listed. Um, so you can see that across the board. The district contributes roughly 80 to 83% of that. Um, and the employee contributes the other 20% or so. And so financially, um, you'll see a very large jump in charges for services if you're going across looking at the audit results versus the proposed budget and what I'm um, proposing for 23-24. That should say adopted budget in 22-23. Sorry about that. The RX rebates um, is our rebates that we get for any prescriptions that our members are filling. This is a a tweak we made probably, I think fiscal year 21 was the first year we did it. So that might be the very first number that we had there. But we um, switched our contract with Medica. So instead of them getting the, all of the prescription rebates, we pay a slightly higher admin rate. And then we got all of the revenue for those rebates. Um, to date, that has worked um, in our favor. Uh, One Digital does do a calculation for us to make sure that the whatever the increase that we paid per member is not exceeding the actual revenue that we're getting in return. And so that has been a positive change for the plan. And again, a small amount of interest earnings makes up the total revenue for this fund. Insurance claims, as you can see, are going up. Uh, if I had more history on here, it would probably be a little um, hard to look at because it's been uh, climbing rapidly, unfortunately, uh, which we've talked a lot about. So we are projecting just over 9.2 million in total insurance claims for the 23-24 school year, uh, with admin fees staying relatively stable, but still going up um, 
we have a slight decline in participation, but still an, a percent increase in our contract with Medica. And so just over $1.1 million. Um, the positive thing of all of these numbers is at the bottom. So we've known for a while that we were going to be under the fund balance goal. Um, so fiscal year 22, we ended at 33%. We are projected to end at about 27% at the end of this fiscal year. Um, but the two increases that we've made, um, along with the contribution that the district, the extra million dollars, it's actually like 1.4 million between the two years, has really turned this around. And it was the right call um, because we are now projecting to slightly increase that fund balance and get back to that 40%, which is where we want to be. Um, so medical plan performance, um, these are just, this is actually a snippet from one of the reports that we get monthly from one digital. So this was our report that we received in February. So you can kind of see some comparisons year over year by member, um, and just gives you some context for that. In my narrative, I did have, um, some data on our, uh, stop loss insurance and then kind of the the picture that we've seen over the last couple of years. And so there's a chart in there that shows the number of claimants that have exceeded 62,500, which is, that's where we start tracking. So it's half of the stop loss premium. Um, and you can see that, that the total number of people has been relatively similar for the last three years. It's still climbing. Um, it went up one each year, but the total claims for those individuals um, for last year, so 25 individuals was $3.8 million. Stop loss uh, was 1.2 million. And I'll just, that 1.2 million, part of our administrative fee is our premium that we're paying for this insurance. So our total administrative cost is just over a million dollars, um, which includes them sending out insurance cards and managing all the claims and making sure that what we're paying back is actually allowable under the plan. And they're doing all of that, um, all of that legal work for us and ensuring that our members have the service that they need. And they're paying out $1.2 million on top. Um, so that is to our benefit, um, that insurance has served us well. However, this means moving forward, that insurance is gonna become more expensive for us. So I'm expecting the next time that we go out to bid, our admin rate's gonna go up um, because they are gonna want to make sure that they are um, covering their own risk. So the total plan, we paid 2.6 um, and then Medica, the insurance covered 1.2 of that, but that's 32.7% of our total claims from 25 people. And that's a tough place to be. Um, we are grateful that our staff have the coverage that they need during difficult times. That's important. Um, we want to be there for our employees, but it does mean that it's difficult for this fund to sustain. But from what I can tell at this point, it's stabilizing. Um, this appears to be kind of our new normal with what we're seeing. And the rate increases that we did, even though they were substantial um, and an impact to the district's general fund budget, were the right choice because um, it appears to be stabilizing. I think that's all I had. So I would welcome any questions you might have. <clears throat> Thank you all so much. Are there any questions from the board members? All right. Got off easy. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Our next item is the policy committee recommendations. Dr. Hillman will present the policies committee recommendations on policies 209, 515.5, 706, and 809. Yes, and so these four policies have been reviewed by the policy committee and the changes are being brought forward for your consideration. Of course, no uh, decision needs to be made this evening, uh, but this is our uh, policy 209. Policy 209 is the board's code of ethics. Uh, there are a handful of changes here, really just updating. The first part is doing some updating um, of the list of stakeholders who we uh, indicate that we will listen to 
Um, what we did is we did mirror what we use for public comment. So we just talk about that in this update, listen to the opinions and views of others, um, other others, other board members, residents, business and property owners, parents, guardians, students, and employees of the Northfield School District. Those are our stakeholders. So we listed those uh, listed those names in the policy. Um, we just added some things about attending assigned committees. Uh, we talked about being uh, in, informed about your proper duties and functions. The board member has outlined in policy 203, something that we uh, had recently uh, reviewed. Uh, we are looking at, um, there's a, there was number six, there was a, we changed the term from insist to recognize that committees be appointed to serve only in advisory capacity. Some other um, changes in, in my responsibilities to my community will be in terms of things like at, using the word advocate as opposed to to attempt. So just some uh, technical changes in the language. And then uh, in addition, if you look under E, there's another some language changes moving from insist to expect in terms of the superintendent keeping the board adequately informed. Using the uh, complaint policy 103 uh, for to help people follow the chain of responsibility. Again, some a few other minor uh, language changes in the rest of that list. And then uh, in letter F, uh, adding uh, and a piece about using school district issued email for board business to limit security and data, data privacy issues. So those are the changes to 209. I think I'll go through all four briefly if that's okay, and then we can come back for any questions on any one of them. 515.5 is new, and this is one that is being recommended for adoption by the Minnesota School Boards Association. Uh, you may have uh, been reading about uh, the state considering some requirements around school districts and other individuals holding um, what's called naloxone, uh, naloxone or Narcan is the, the typical um, term that is used. We are starting to see, we have long had uh, Narcan in each of our school nurses offices for some time. This is a, a life-saving drug that should we have someone on campus who does have uh, an overdose that we are able to use that to help um, stabilize that individual until help can arrive. And so it's something that we've been working uh, with a number of community partners for some time. Uh, but what MSBA is recommending is now as we're seeing this more commonplace that uh, school districts should have a policy on how we utilize that. So it's a new recommended policy. We did very minimal changes to it because this is in it's anticipated to align with any legislation that might come forward on this. So we feel when MSBA does the work with their legal team, that we need to bring it to you as we can always, of course, make modifications as time goes on. But my recommendation to you is to take MSBA's uh, recommended policy on this first round. So there were um, very, I don't think there were any changes actually recommended on this one. When we take a look at the next policy, which is policy 706, the acceptance of gifts, um, some very minimal changes, but enough to where we felt we needed to bring it forward to you prior um, if there had any, we had received gifts that were valued at $1,000 or more, that required school district acceptance. Uh, as you see, we ask you to, uh, uh, through the consent grouping, adopt all gifts that come to the district. So we just want the policy to align with that. Um, and then really at the end, it is about making sure that uh, people who do make gifts to the district understand that once they make the gift to the district, that the district is able to do with it um, what it, at our sole discretion, what we would see to be the best use of that gift in whichever format that that could be. So um, I think again, they are substantial enough that we felt we needed to bring them forward to you. And then finally, uh, policy 809, uh, this is around the naming of school buildings. This is a policy that we adopted in 2020. This is the first time that it's come through for an update. Uh, there's some minor language changes. Um, reiterating that the board has final decision-making authority on any naming of facilities. And then that original policy, uh, there were a couple of buildings that were going to be required to be renamed under the new policy. So it had given uh, a deadline and that of course is no longer uh, relevant. So we're striking that portion from the policy. So those are the four policies that are for first reading this evening. I'd be happy to answer any questions that people have at this time. Thank you so much. Are there any questions or comments? I have two questions. I think, Dr. Hillman, you can probably cover both of these. Uh, in my time on the policy committee, I know there had been discussion around uh, 
naming of parents and guardians versus caretakers, um, some changes at the state level, but also how we want to recognize that. I noticed here we're still at parents and guardians, and I don't recall where we were in that conversation. And I also thought it would be good to talk about publicly and not just at the committee level. You're referring to policy 515. I'm sorry, 209 code of ethics. 209 code of ethics. And obviously it's something that's referenced in many policies. Yep, uh, we just missed that one on this time so did, through. And, and I wasn't bringing up for that matter, but is it something that, I, remind me, is that something we have? Yes, changed? I mean, it, it is a part where we are starting to use the, the term parent, guardian, caregiver, um, because yeah. there are there are other people who might not be a parent or a guardian specifically who have responsibility for a student or who have authority to act on a child's behalf for a variety of reasons. Um, so we have worked on implementing uh, the term caregiver as part of that as well. I thank you for the reminder and we'll make sure we take care of that. Okay, thank you. And then the other- And to be more inclusive. Yeah. Of course. And, and I honestly, I couldn't recall where we were at the conversation, if it was something we had adopted or just considering. So I appreciate you sharing that publicly. The other question I have is also on 209 Code of Ethics. Uh, section two, letter C, number six, where you mentioned the change from insist to recognize. I'm a little confused by how the sentence is framed now. Are we referring to a committee as a whole or individuals who are assigned to committees? I feel like there's a word missing there maybe with the change. So I, I think that what it's intending is that uh, to recognize that committees are appointed to serve only in an advisory capacity to the to the board so that a, there is not a committee that has board this or decision making authority so they can make recommendations they can do so the previous one was insist the uh it, we felt it was a better way to look at it to, for the board to recognize that the committees are appointed to serve an advisory capacity they can make recommendations to the board they can give reports to the board but that they are not the, the board should maintain and understand its decision making authority and that it's not conceding that so the concept was Rather than insisting, that seems like when you're playing the committees, recognizing that just a committee, a committee gives you a report, you can choose to accept it or not. If many times if we do it the way we normally do it, you will most likely adopt something that a committee has brought forward. It's not often that that is the case that a formal committee um, recommendation is coming to the board, but to make sure that people understood that it's the board that has the authority, that the board is recognizing that those committees only serve in an advisory capacity. Okay, I appreciate that explanation. I think the issue is with change and insist to recognize changes the verb usage there. So maybe B should be R. I think that's how you actually said it a couple of times. Got it. I think that's the simple fix here. Very good. That's it, thanks. Got that, Anita. Good, thank you. Anyone else comment or question on any of the policies? Okay, very good, thank you. Right, item C, um, Superintendent Operation and Strategic Plan Update. Yes, we uh, have covered just a couple of items tonight. Um, first, uh, celebratory, uh, we wanna share that uh, retired Northfield School District uh, Activities Director, Student Director of Student Activities, Tom Groutman, was recently inducted to the Minnesota Interscholastic Activities Administrators Association Hall of Fame. That was back at their banquet uh, on March 29th. Uh, for people who uh, have been around a while, they know that Tom was a longtime uh, Northfield School District staff member. He was a teacher, he was a coach, director of student activities over 30 years with the district. And uh, he continues, I still see him several times a month uh, as he is substituting in our schools regularly. And uh, it's great, he will come in for some of the shorter term substitute pieces like a couple of hours, someone needs somebody for a couple of hours, things like that. So he's really, again, continuing to contribute to the school district in so many ways. In my report, I listed all of the different ways that Tom, everybody knows that Tom was at nearly every event when he was activities director, just you couldn't turn around. How can Tom be in two places at once? But he was just at swimming and now we see him at basketball, just very dedicated to the role. And then I think something that maybe people knew less about was Tom's commitment to student activities across the state. So we listed all of the ways that he had supported interscholastic athletics uh, and other activities across the entire state, including being instrumental in the Why We Play program, um, and just his role as the state high school league board of, on the board of directors and as president. Uh, president, and so we're very proud of Tom and his accomplishments and his legacy that uh, continues uh, being made with the Northfield School District. So I just wanted to share that important piece about Tom Groutman, just a an excellent Northfield School District ambassador and champion. Uh, the second part, I want to just give you a heads up in light of what we're discussing later this evening. 
uh, around our priority based budget reductions. It's going to seem counterintuitive, but I just want board members and community to know uh, about uh, an increase that will likely be required of us in special education. And so uh, Cheryl Hall, the director of uh, special services and our incoming director of special services, assistant director uh, right now, Sarah Pratt, this is the time of the year where there a lot of IEPs are being rewritten, um, just updating it for the year. We are also looking at how the different cohorts of students move into the K-12 system from preschool and how they move into different buildings um, when we have student, new students that join us at various grade levels. And so we're starting to do the projections for what are the caseloads, what are the, uh, the students who are going to require special education services next year. And so while we don't yet have specific FTE data available, we want you to know it is likely that we will need to increase uh, by a couple of, at least a couple, if not three, uh, FTE and special education. And the reason is threefold. Number one, in early childhood education, we are seeing uh, a number of additional students who are qualifying earlier for special education services. This is a good thing. What we know is the research tells us that the earlier that we intervene, the better the chance that we have to help students um, no longer need to receive special education services when they turn seven years old. So this is a, we're investing early to be able to make sure that we help students uh, get the skills that they need so that they don't continue to qualify uh, for um, special education services after they turn age seven. It's really about helping them, them develop the uh, academic and social skills where they are able to be independent in the classroom without those additional services. So in early childhood special education, we are already projecting uh, some real crunch in especially our hand-in-hand -hand preschool program. Now, we don't have additional room in our hand-in-hand -hand preschool program. We have a history of working with other local preschools, purchasing slots uh, from those preschools to make sure students get that general education time that they need to also be able to grow their skills as part of early childhood special education. So that's an area that we know is uh, um, really growing. In fact, we have just a few slots left in our hand-in-hand -hand preschool uh, next year, and we have more than 25 students who are waiting for their evaluation uh, to be completed. So it is more than likely that we're going to need some additional support there. We also have an incoming kindergarten class next fall uh, that will have a substantial number of students entering kindergarten with higher needs. And so we, we know that it's a good work that we've done with our preschools. So that we're able to anticipate what those needs are as students go into a full day kindergarten program and how they are going to be supported uh, to be able to meet the needs in their IEPs. And then the final area that we have a concern about uh, in terms of just how much staffing that we have to meet the needs of those students is that rising ninth grade class has more students receiving special education services than the graduating class. So every year, every school reinvents itself. You know, a cohort leaves and a new cohort comes in. So the new cohort of ninth graders coming into Northfield High School next year um, have more students with spe who need special services than the senior class graduating. Now, many times when that happens, we are able to reduce FTE in another building because a cohort is obviously leaving another area. And unfortunately, in this circumstance, the incoming sixth grade class will have a similar set of needs to the exiting eighth grade class at Northfield Middle School. So the numbers aren't different enough where we are able to make that reduction like we normally would if, a, if we have a cohort of students who just happens to be a larger cohort. And as they move through, uh, the staffing uh, aligns with them. So again, we don't have all of the details yet. But we just want to make sure that people are aware as we continue in the spring. We'll understand that it, you know, for the person who doesn't understand what we're talking about, this can be a little counterintuitive. We're talking about budget reductions, but we're also talking about the potential of having to uh, increase staffing. While you've heard me talk many times, and I'll continue to talk about it tonight, about the special education cross subsidy, we do get some reimbursement for special education. It's not enough, right? It's not all that uh, has been promised. So even that full FTE, will, there will be some reimbursement for that. So we just want board members in the community to, to hear this now so that they're not thinking, well, wait a minute, why didn't you tell us that before you made budget adjustments? We just don't have all of the details yet because right now is the time of the year where a lot of these IEPs are being reviewed. Uh, and again, we are pleased to provide students with exceptional support. Students who receive special education services receive exceptional support in the school district. It is just an issue of how many students will need those services next year. The silver lining is that 
finding special licensed special education teachers is challenging to say the least right now. But what I'm hearing from our special uh, services department is that we are seeing a quality group of uh, applicants so far on these positions. So our reputation as a quality place to support special education students is, is a good thing. And we are getting some good candidates for positions that are currently open, which gives us hope for positions that will be open uh, as we finalize those caseloads yet this year. So that is the report that I have this evening. Thank you so much for that. Board members, do you have any questions or comments? Amy. I just have a question about timing for the new teachers. Is that something we'll have to that will have to come be before us and we'll have to vote on it? Yes. So when will May. that happen? Yep, May. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Okay, thank you very much. All right, we're on item six. The consent grouping, as a reminder, there were some personnel items in the table file added to the consent grouping, as well as an update to the minutes. Is there anything anyone would like to pull from the consent grouping for separate consideration? No. Nope. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? Okay, moved by Corey, second by Amy. All those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, item seven is items for individual action. And we have four items tonight. Um, I just have some brief comments before we um, jump into the um, first item, which is the budget prioritization for the elementary package reductions. Um, we're about to take action on this 2023-24 budget. And with much input and comment from our community, this board will now do the work assigned to us by the district stakeholders. We have put in the work, we've asked the questions, we've considered the domino effect, and most importantly, um, as I've mentioned, we heard from our community. The proposal in front of us um, has changed, um, and that's that comes thanks to district, the board, and the community listening to each other. Um, we are required to make these reductions because of factors outside of our hands, that is chronic underfunding on the part of the state of Minnesota and declining enrollment across the country. I'm grateful um, as well for our clean audit report highlighting that we as a district are well managed um, and we have a small administrative team comparatively. I also want to recognize that we live in a community um, which has generously voted for increased um, taxes over the years in support of our local levies and bonds. We're incredibly grateful to have such support for our district students. Together, we will be both good stewards of funds, state and local, and provide our students an education at the elementary, middle school, and high school that will prepare every student for lifelong success by developing critical thinkers who are curious and ready to engage in society. Um, just wanna say, we all understand that the reductions are not easy and that we're sorry we have to make them, um, but we're grateful our district will still have Lots of choice. We'll still have um, wonderful art, music, after school programs, early education, professional development, and competitive wages. We will um, move forward with approving a healthy, sustainable budget that's good for all kids. Um, board members, you will have an opportunity to pull items from each packet. Please wait to be recognized. When, when we come to the vote, if Anita requests, we will conduct a roll call vote. Um, during the discussion, in order to respect everyone's voice around the table, I ask you to keep your comments brief and restrain yourself to a couple of questions. I'm happy to come back around if you have further questions once others have taken a turn. And as always, this board is respectful of all opinions and appreciative of the hard work our administrators put into this proposal. Dr. Hillman, do you have any comments before we move to the first item? I do. And uh, what I'm going to do is I just want to frame a couple of comments and I do want to just briefly review the reduction packages because some things have changed. So I'm going to do a little bit of a line by line just because I want to be super clear about what we are talking about tonight. And I will move through those quickly because I know everyone here has gone through them, but I just, I think it honors the work uh, that has been done to this point just to take some time to review that. So I, I do want to echo that um, these cuts will be painful. Uh, there's they are painful because of the, th the things that are plainly visible are obviously painful, as well as those that are less visible to others, because everything that we are talking about this evening does have value to someone, right? We have offer excellent district services. We offer excellent elementary education, excellent secondary education, 
Um, and it's difficult because these things have been, we have worked hard to provide high quality programming for people and high quality services in a very efficient way. Uh, so I want to emphasize something that, that Claudia said, members of this board and people who have watched uh, our uh, board actions over the years know that on an annual basis, we hear from auditors who laud our financial stewardship. Uh, we continue to receive outstanding bonding ratings from the nation's leading uh, financiers in terms of a double A plus bond rating. That's because of the good work that this board and everyone within the school district has done. Uh, routinely, you hear every year that uh, we are lauded for how much money, what percentage of our budget goes directly to student services, right? In terms of our overhead, uh, very low. Uh, as Claudia said, our community has stepped forward time and time again to help fill in that chronic underfunding that we have been fighting for three decades uh, from a state legislature that right now has a chance to pull off another Minnesota miracle. And we will see if they do that as they come back uh, from break tomorrow. We will continue to advocate strongly for our priorities of increasing the formula by 5% in each year of the biennium, tying it to inflation and fully funding the special education cross subsidy. I know that that's not what's in either of the two bills that are before the chambers, but this is what our, these are what our priorities are, and we will continue to advocate for them fiercely until the governor signs the bills into law. So uh, the legislature can expect to hear from us again starting tomorrow as we have tried to respect their break. I want to just again thank everyone in the community for coming forward and being part of the process. When we think about this, we launched this uh, in February. We shared the budget targets just before the, uh, the February 27th board meeting. So people have had quite a bit of time to interact with it. Uh, we heard from people also at the March 13th board meeting. You had, a you had a chance to discuss it then. We had two well attended public hearings. We have shared the reductions through our local media, KYMN radio on numerous occasions and the Northfield News. Uh, you had an opportunity just last week to discuss this in greater detail in a work session. And we are here tonight. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the amazing uh, work that our district youth council did to have an overflowing uh, student event at Northfield High School back on March 16th. So when we talk about process in this community, this community expects a full fair process that make sure that we are considering as many of the uh, items in, in full detail as possible. And I think that uh, people can feel good about the process. None of us like the results, but we can feel good about the process. And so I am going to review uh, the reductions right now. And again, I wanna thank everyone for the emails, the calls and all of the participation. Some people might say, are you really being serious that you really appreciate that? And I do, I sincerely appreciate it because this is a community that understands that democracy is not a spectator sport and that they need to be involved. We are being good role models for our students who see a very functioning democratic process right before their eyes. And so I'm very grateful to this community uh, for their engagement in it. So Tim, I've plugged in here, if you can. So we will start with the uh, elementary package uh, and the elementary package has two items. First of all, I just wanna reiterate that at the top of each package are the priority statements uh, that those uh, committees last year, our, our five-year uh, budget priority process that uh, had over 70 stakeholders involved in it last year, these were the priority statements that they shared. Uh, recognizing that this year with having to make another round of reductions, sometimes those priorities can come into conflict, can't they, right? Because Multiple things can be priorities, but when you have less uh, resources, sometimes those priorities come into conflict, and that's where we have to make some of these very difficult decisions. And so you will see in the elementary package, two items, uh, discontinuing elementary portage, again, for the low amount of students. It's been an exceptional program, uh, but we just only have 14 students participating. It's just not something that is sustainable. Um, reducing six elementary sections uh, due to declining enrollment. And so that is... Uh, the bulk, that's the elementary package. When we look at the secondary package, we look at a reduction uh, in FTE at Northfield High School based on student numbers per course. And you have seen what that 3.1 in FTE would result in. That's been in your packets for a couple of meetings now. Reducing a credit recovery educational assistant position at Northfield High School. 
um, reducing three special education educational assistants and replacing uh, those positions with one special education teacher. This reduction is happening both at the middle school and at the high school. I want to reiterate that those positions are vacant positions. We have been struggling to hire uh, in all the educational position, educational assistant positions that are available. We have had a thought process that we have had, a, as I mentioned before, we have a good pool, uh, a better than most pool of special education teachers. And our idea is that we might, we are able to hire a special education teacher more easily than we can three educational assistants. And so by doing that, we're able to provide services to students in a different way. And there is a small savings when you do that offset. This continuing the secondary portage program along with software. And again, uh, as I've shared, we've been working on a partnership, uh, something that we envision calling the big nine online right now in uh, the first year, next year, uh, one of our, the big nine schools, Owatonna will be the host. They are one of the big nine districts that have the most students participating in all the time online education. Uh, the initial partners in that cooperative will be Northfield, Faribault, and Owatonna. We have a history of working together before in the Cannon Valley Special Education Service Cooperative. And we know several other of the big nine conference schools are also considering to come together. What we're seeing is just a real change in that all the time online marketplace. Uh, as we know, many students wanting to be back in person there are still a substantial number of students who do want the all the time online program, but many school districts are not able to continue offering their own program. So you're going to see some of these cooperatives develop, and we feel that we have a good history of working with these other schools and thinking of it more broadly across the big nine. And uh, Daryl Keller, uh, the Portage Director, shared that with families last week. We'll start to work with them as we keep moving ahead with developing that program. Uh, reducing science Olympiad and math teams at the high school, those two programs had been vacant. We had not had any students participating in those programs for some time, so they had been functionally eliminated, but they had not been financially eliminated. So that is what this uh, is taking, of course, down the line. If we have interest and people want to bring it, that's something we can decide at that time. Uh, the first item here I want to show of, of a change is uh, in the... Um, increase of the ticket prices on line number 12, increasing ticket prices for admission to activities uh, by $1. You'll see that that now has a strike through in $2. After we heard from people specifically about the uh, concern about the loss of the activity bus, we increased it from $1 of the increase of the gate fee to $2. The first dollar will support the high school activities department and the second dollar will fund the activity bus. So people will pay a couple more dollars to attend a high school event, but they will know clearly where that money is going to. It's helping that after school activity bus. And it is also making sure that we could um, not have reductions in the high school activity program. So you'll see also on line 14 that had been discontinued in the after school activity bus. We've crossed that out. All right, line number 13 was reducing the use of coach buses for activities, again, really focusing on only using coach buses in those cases where there's equipment that needs to be uh, taken along and where we just, Benjamin just, Benjamin bus does not want to carry a trailer behind it. They've got safety concerns. That's the purpose of using a coach bus. And so we anticipate that being a savings of $60,000. You'll see reducing the extra days for high school counselors from 15 to 10 days. They have some additional time outside of the school year, but this is reduction in the total number of days yet. They do have, uh, four counselors now as opposed to three. So they feel that that is something that is workable. Uh, reducing the high school administrative assistant for attendance, the total number of hours there. Replacing the Randolph Ag education option with a class at Northfield High School. This is the beginning of growing an ag program at Northfield High School. And I'd like to point out that this is a result of listening to the community's objection to eliminating the ag program last year. We heard the community, we did not eliminate the ag program. And we are now looking at bringing it back, back to Northfield High School as opposed to having that partnership. So I think for the community, that shows that when people bring forth concerns, we have listened, we've made changes, and then we have a more positive result that's coming out uh, in the long term. We are looking at reducing one administrative assistant at the Area Learning Center, uh, a partial reduction in the software costs for credit recovery. Uh, we are also looking at uh, reducing the academic advocate position at the Area Learning Center. It's actually the elimination. 
uh, restructuring the Northfield Middle School schedule to a six period day, which is currently a seven period day. This is also an updated recommendation in that the recommendation uh, says now that that change would begin in 2024, 25. We have heard from uh, a number of people, obviously at the public meetings, via email, from staff, from students, from the community, uh, about concerns about that change to the six period day. And a number of the concerns were are just around the onboarding or the ramp up to that kind of change. And so by delaying the implementation, by updating the recommendation to uh, implement that a year out, we feel that we will be able to work with stakeholders to address the very valid concerns that have been brought forward to be able to make sure that when we launch into a six period day that we've done so in a very thoughtful way, doing it together as out uh, and proactively um, as opposed to reactively in the spring for the coming fall. So I really want to thank all the people who've provided that feedback so that we can create a longer uh, ramp for that uh, to be a longer runway, if you will, for that change to be made. Then you'll see the next few items were about reducing middle school activities and increasing activity fees. Those have all been stricken through. Line 22C, you will see that that is the culmination of all those components around middle school activities. And so the updated recommendation is that we will increase middle school and high school activity fees. And what we are recommending to you is that you give the administration the target of raising activities fees in a way across middle school and high school activities that make the most sense and that that, that would generate an additional $131,000 in revenue. So it is you are going to set what the target is. The administrators will put together a, a schedule of activity fees, grades 6 through 12, that would be uh, reasonable, would be um, would be appropriate for the activity, considering things like the transportation cost for each uh, each activity, and be able to do so in a way that we can distribute those activity fees in a way that are reasonable and make sense, and yet generate one hundred and thirty one thousand uh, dollars minimum of additional revenue. You'll see reducing school psychologists overload at the middle school, changing the span the NMS Amistades elective to every other day. Um, we're going to shift the Will Program Educational Assistant funding from the general fund to achievement and integration funding. That's a state um, a state funding source that we have access to now. As we shift to the district services package, uh, you will see beginning with line number 26, uh, reducing the child nutrition administrative assistant and combining those duties with the district office receptionist, switching absence management software and time tracking software, transferring buildings and grounds equipment budget from some of it from the uh, general fund to the capital projects levy, uh, discontinuing our membership with schools for equity and education, discontinuing our financial forecasting software. We'll go back to using our own, uh, our own spreadsheets that Val will develop and has developed over time, uh, charging allowable percentage of finance and HR software to operating capital, um, looking at uh, implementing a new buildings and grounds work order system, something that's similar. It's actually the same software that our technology services department uses. So there's some efficiencies there. Uh, reducing our communications and public relations budget, discontinuing uh, a portion of the hotspots that we had started to purchase and pay for for students in need during the pandemic, ramping that down and helping people transition to uh, new free programs that are available from some vendors. That's again, phasing out that uh, service that we provided to people during the pandemic, changing our backup process for Google Suite data. Right now we're doing uh, multiple backups. For, we feel that we are able to move it to a single backup system. Um, moving from our current method of broadcasting uh, board video example, we're, for, we're gonna be doing it tonight. Tonight's meeting will be published to YouTube as opposed to Eduvision that will save us a small amount of money and we are converting all of the previous board meetings for some time to move over to uh, YouTube as well. So the archives that we have going back to 2012 or something like that will still be available. Uh, eliminating star testing at the middle school, uh, reducing a volunteer coordinator position and running those through our buildings, and then discontinuing the Amity intern program. Uh, that is a, a, a program that has helped uh, small group support for the Compañeros program at our elementary schools. And then I did just, had, we had included uh, just a reminder about three items that had been officially voted on being reduced last year, but their implementation of that reduction was delayed one year and we used uh, federal COVID-19 relief funding to help pay for that on, uh, this year. The first of which is something we'll talk about again later about reducing the transportation budget, 
And then it also includes um, the high school parking lot security monitor, uh, reducing some small group reading support at Bridgewater and reducing the additional behavior coach at uh, Greenvale Park. So I think it's just important that we walk through each one of those again. So explicitly for people watching on uh, online and here that they have a chance to hear what those uh, recommended reductions are with those updates. So these are painful. This is very difficult. I wanna thank everybody for leaning in and doing this very difficult work. We are hopeful that the legislature will come through. Today is April 10th. We don't anticipate them actually completing their process for another month. That's why we have shared before that Despite what the legislature does this session, we can't say that we're going to bring back any programming for the 23-24 school year because we do need to stabilize the budget so we can do everything that we can to avoid having to make these additional any additional reductions next year. So I hope that that's helpful for board members. Thank you for indulging me as I think it was important we walk through each of those again. Okay, thank you very much. Amy, did you have a question? Yes, I just have a question for clarification. Um, for number 24, um, the change in the middle school Spanish elective to every other day, um, would that start immediately or is that contingent on, you know, if the, the six period schedule change and that, then it would start a year from now? Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Jelano that he is here. I, my anticipation was it was going to start next year, but are you, what are you? I, I just, if we're going to get. Want to come up to the mic, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, my goal is that if we, if you would approve that we have a planning year, that we, I would keep um, the Amistad program the way it is, which is every day in seventh and eighth grade, um, versus going immediately to the every other day piece. It still keeps the spread between um, our instructor shared with the high school and middle school exactly the same. So it doesn't change that piece of it. Does that help, Amy? Yes, thank you. Any other clarifying questions? Okay. Did you, Jeff, you had a question? Um, we, we kind of talked about Can you turn your mic on, Jeff? Yeah, on uh, M22C, you got B structure for grades six or 12 will be determined by administration. And I, I wanted to add with board approval. And you kind of did say that, you know, I'm sure that what you come back with and say, hey, how are we going to spend? Give us three different scenarios or whatever, how to spend the 130 and come back to us for board approval. Uh, that certainly can be the case. I think we've typically had board members approve fees over the years, anytime we've had a change in fees. Um, but we'll most likely bring back one recommendation. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. Anyone else? Questions? Okay. Um, I'm. I wanted to also say I'm not a par parliamentarian. I can barely say the word, so I'm going to ask Dr. Hillman and, and Anita to help support us. Um, okay. So the first item is the budget prioritization elementary package reductions. Are there any specific line items that board members would like to remove for separate consideration? I will ask three times. Are there any items board members would like to uh, remove for separate consideration. Are there any items board members would like to remove? Thank you. Hearing no items um, to be removed, I will take a motion to approve the elementary budget reduction package as presented. Moved by Robert. Second by Amy. Thank you. All those in favor of a oh, I'm sorry. discussion, if people have any comments. They want oh, I'm to sorry. Up. Yes, this is the note that I meant to give myself. Is there any discussion on this item? Thank you. All those in favor of approving the elementary budget reduction package as presented, um, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Okay. Item B is the secondary package reductions. Are there any specific line items that board members would like to remove for separate consideration? Jeff? Uh, M21. 21, okay. Okay, item 21. 21. Okay, are there any other items board members would like to remove? Amy? Just because it's intertwined with M21, I would want to remove M24. Okay, line number 24. 
Are there any other items board members would like to remove for separate consideration? I'll ask two more times. Are there any other items board members would like to remove? Any other items? Okay. Now I will take a motion to approve the secondary budget reduction package as presented with the exception of line 21 and 24. Okay. Moved by Ben. Second. By Corey. All those in favor? Oh, I'm discussion. sorry. <laughs> Okay, I just want to make sure people Thank have a chance you. to make any discussion. I know, I got to follow my script Sorry exactly. Okay, yes. Is there any discussion on the um, the budget prioritization package for the secondary level? Corey? Just like to iterate what Dr. Hillman said earlier about the involvement from all levels of stakeholders, from district administrators to the community, as well as this board. This is the sixth meeting we've discussed this at length. And, um, you know, people who might be just tuning in tonight be might be wondering why we're moving so quickly through it. But, you know, by my account, we've got 12 hours of discussion roughly into this, uh, in addition to dozens of emails and phone calls and obviously independent meetings with Dr. Hillman. So I just want to recognize that and let folks who may be tuning in wondering, how are they making such big decisions so quickly? So um, I also support the package as is, and I look forward to discussing line item 21 as well. Oh, very good. Ben. Thanks, Claudia. And I just wanted to say thank you to the community as well as a, as a new board member, not being as familiar with what this process would look like, you know, it can seem fairly complicated. And I think, you know, the, the district and hopefully the board did a good job communicating what, you know, the process was seeking in, input. And certainly, I think, you know, we received a lot of emails. These were not, as, as Dr. Hillman has said many times, easy choices or easy decisions to make, you know, and, and it would be sad if we weren't getting these kind of comments. So I think we've arrived at a, a good place based on the feedback that we've heard, certainly address some of my concerns that were there when I initially saw the, the, the reductions is put forth. Um, and so, yeah, I'll be voting tonight, like, like Corey to support as, as is. Um, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Benny. I just kind of wanted to follow uh, Corey and Ben a little bit and make some overall comments on the on the entire budget um, reduction process. Um, I, our finance director Val and our administrative staff, along with Dr. Hillman, I think um, worked really hard and and did present us board members with um, reduction packages um, that I think they were very done in a very earnest and faithful fashion. And so I'm very appreciative of that um, hard work that that you've done. And especially our finance director's budget strategy um, and, and educating all of us board members on that strategy. I really appreciate that. Um, one kind of area of concern that I had, though, throughout this process was um, that school board oversees the budget, but we also have responsibility for um, governance of the district. And I think that in order to carry out um, the governance as well as overseeing the budget that all of us members need to, should be should be taking a look at the budget line item by line item. And I know that um, a lot of times we look at the budget just summary in summary fashion of, of each fund on its own, but I really think that from here on out that we should be taking a look at every line item and so that we have a better ability just moving forward. Um, not that another reduction is in the future, and I hope not, but I I, I think it's regardless of whether or not um, we'll be taking a look at any future reductions. I just think it's something um, that we need to do. And then also, I just wanted to mention a positive note. Um, if there is anything positive at all about this reduction process, it was actually something that Dr. Hillman mentioned to me a while back. Um, he had said that, you know, although we're making all these reductions and we're taking things away, it doesn't mean that we can't ever add, you know, programs and services. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to remember. And it is very positive. And so, of course, that got me thinking, um, kind of going down a rabbit hole myself. And after hearing a lot of community members messaging us about 
um, their interest in, in the activities and sports, especially, I think that's the common ground that we see here. And that's a positive thing. You know, our community is all highly values the activities and sports. And we saw that through the messages that we received as a board and at the public hearing. And so I think that I, I started doing some thinking on my own and talking to, um, I talked to a, another building administrator at another school and something they're doing is um, kind of a fundraising thing for their activities and sports where parents, teachers, students, and community members can volunteer up at uh, Twins games and uh, Vikings games. And it actually, it brings in tens of thousands of dollars per year that the schools can use for um, sports and activities. And I thought that was a really good idea, but that's probably just one of many ideas I think that could come out of this, hopefully. And if, and I know it's not the school's responsibility, but um, it's still a positive thing that we can all start talking about, I think. And so if there is anything, a silver lining here, I think that would be it. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Anyone else want to make a comment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to echo all the thank yous to uh, the board members, administration, uh, teachers, students, uh, all stakeholders just for their participation in this process. I would say in my years on the board, I've probably been through different versions of this uh, three or four times. Um, very similar to kind of what we're doing now. So I think that uh, robust discuss discussion and debate is always a good thing. And the uh, public has had time to uh, voice an opinion, um, but obviously we always would like more, but uh, um, we're just moving forward with where we're at. So I appreciate everybody participating. Good, thank you. Anyone else? Amy. I think we're all saying similar things, but I just really want to thank the administration for the process that um, was put into this and um, for the encouragement of all the different stakeholders to communicate with us. And they did. So I want to thank the stakeholders as well. And it's been a hard process, but I feel more comfortable going through it, knowing that we've heard from so many people. Absolutely. Anyone else? Robert. Well, I'll sign the card as well to our to all of our the stakeholders who we've heard from. I that has really helped me as I think about the impacts uh, that this will have, um, and also acknowledge the hard work of our administrators who we have asked as a board to come forward with these reductions, um, these this plan, and also acknowledge the, the the hard work that our that our professional staff is going to have to go through if if these proposals pass uh they're going to be the ones that are implementing this um, on the ground level you know it it's frustrating that that we are in this place but i believe that that it's it's important that we remain careful financial stewards saying we could go ahead with significant uh, deficit spending for a year or two, uh, but then would face a day of reckoning where uh, we would face drastic changes to our district. And I, I don't think that would be be doing what is best for our students. Uh, by getting in front of this, uh, we are we are demonstrating quality financial management and, and stewardship and action. And I, uh, I that's that's what's guiding me through this process. Thank you so much. Okay, is there any more discussion, comments, questions? All right. Um, okay, so now we are um, all, so we have a motion and a second on the secondary package. Um, okay, all those in favor of approving the secondary package, secondary budget reduction package as presented with the exception of items line 21 and 24 say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. That package passes. And now we will consider the two items which were pulled. First line 21. Uh, yeah, line. First we will um, discuss line 21. Okay, so we will have a discussion. Um, I will recognize you. Be, um, be thoughtful of all the members wanting to make a question or make a comment. I will close the discussion. Session, and then I will ask for a motion and then we will vote. Okay. Does anybody have a comment or um, a question? Jeff? Um, yeah, when you bring this to the vote, um, I guess I'm confused or would like some more clarification of how 
if we go to keep seven period day uh, versus what's offered, is that a yes vote or a no vote? Yeah, I think, oh, may I answer that question? Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think it depends on what the motion is, right? I mean, if, if the motion is to approve the reduction as presented, then a no vote, right, would be the would be your pace of saying we don't want that to move forward. If there's a different motion, we it would depend on what the motion is. But let's just hypothetically someone moves to approve the reduction as presented, and then that motion does not pass, we do not move ahead. Right. Yep. Good question. Anyone else? Okay, Amy. So um, with the new possible schedule of six hours instead of seven hours, I see that as a major paradigm shift for the middle school. And I think they've only had two months at this point to think it through because of the schedule that we've had for this. And I think it's a process that needs more than two months. Uh, my hesitance at this point in voting to approve this line item is only because, not, not that I'm against completely a six hour uh, schedule, mm -hmm. but because I don't know enough to feel comfortable approving it. And so for me, I would rather give them more time to the middle school, more time to do research, to come to flesh out the idea. I know there's some yin and yang with this. That they don't want to do too much work, but I still don't feel like I have enough information on what this would really look like and how, uh, how it would affect our school. Um, so I'm uncomfortable approving it this early. I would be happy to hear more about it, you know, in January or whenever the right timing would be for that. Um, so at this point, I'm going to vote against it because of the time element that we're, you know, the line 21 right now is approving it to start in a year, and I'm not ready to, to do that. Um, and then I pulled out line 24. I'm just going to mention that because only because it's intertwined. And so I feel I can't approve both, you know, 24 without approving 21. They go hand in hand. Yes, uh, regarding the six period day reduction. I think one positive thing that I thought about anyway um, is that the six period day would allow for longer class periods, which I, I think would, would benefit both teachers and students. And also um, there would be minimized distractions with that one less uh, transition, I guess. And, and I know as a parent of two middle school kids, distractions are inevitable. And so anything that we can do to minimize those, um, I would be grateful for. However, I had a lot of concerns about um, this reduction in the beginning myself. And then hearing all of the feedback, the tremendous amount of feedback that we received from the community regarding this um, just amplified my concerns greatly. Um, the, the middle school years are very pivotal years, I think, um, for a number of reasons, but mainly the ages um, of the students that we're looking at, you know, are going through physical changes, mental changes, emotional changes almost daily. And then to take and completely disrupt the, their seven period day, which seems to have been working out really well in my eyes, and being a middle school parent for a while now, um, I just I just feel that that disruption, along with um, considering their grade levels and ages and where they're at, would would cause more damage um, than good. So although I I do see a lot of positives here with this reduction, and I'm really grateful that our administrators worked so hard at bringing us this um, because it does have positives to it. Um, I, I just, and I, I also want to want to mention though that I I have faith in our um, building administrators and staff that they would deliver um, this reduction um, in a way that would work out. I think, but um, I'm kind of with Amy a little bit in that um, I I I just don't feel that there are factors beyond our administrators' control here, and so. 
three months or a year and three months. I, I just think that those factors are still going to be present and the issues are still going to be there. And so it's for those reasons that I also won't be able to support this. Thank you, Jenny. Jeff? Um, yeah, I think, um, so I, I believe the way the motion will go as far as, you know, I'll be voting for no change. So I think that'll be a no vote the way that, you know, phrase it for, I'm for keeping the seven period day. And kind, kind of what I heard, I mean, as a, I don't know, more kind of, I think of myself more as a kind of a business guy. It's kind of like, what, what services do you want to provide? And I just heard after listening to all of the parents that, I mean, the seven period day was a, was a huge deal. And I didn't really hear any kind of talk, you know, really kind of more pro that the seven, the seven is, I mean, the six is better. It was just all about money. So I, I know it's a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's two FTEs. Where's that going to come from? Um, you know, that we could, you know, figure out. That's the the big question, obviously. But I, um, uh, second part that I heard when I was listening to parents um, just, just mentioned the idea of, of choice, and they really liked the idea of of uh, the the priority uh, for the kids to have study halls. And I know a lot of those kids are going to use those study halls productively and study. Or uh, real proactive students and parents are going to reach out to the teacher that they need help on uh, to go, you know, talk to to get that help at that particular time. I thought that that was a a point that I heard quite a bit. Um, also, uh, uh, with the study halls. Um, or, or any, along with the other parts, the, the, just the freedom also with, with electives. That was another big thing that I was hearing. They just thought that there was a little bit more choice within the seven period day with, with electives. And that was just something that, uh, that was really voiced that I really kind of picked up on. And, I mean, obviously it's an emotional issue. I really saw a lot of, I mean, any cut that anybody's having, it was just a bit a very emotional for, for any of these cuts, if you're affected, because I mean, you know, real people are getting affected by this. And it's just a matter of, I don't look at it necessarily as cuts. I look at it as, you know, downsizing and hopefully right sizing. And this seems to be a thing of a process that we're going to go after over the, the few years of what's, I shouldn't say right size, but what's the realistic size of what we're going to be as a district and long term, what are we offering for services? And this is, you know, obviously something that's, um, the hot button right now. And then lastly, um, I would also like to thank the Northfield Education Association uh, and the four leaders that signed the letter that you uh, all got on April 6th. Basically, on, on, on the main points of the letter, they had six different points on there. I know that you probably read that, but uh, uh, was the contention of the Northfield Education Association that they felt um, that the $200,000 investment um, in remaining the way that I'm reading this with the seven period day um, was uh, uh, a good idea to invest in. Um, and then also they suggested out of their six points, some, some other cuts or, you know, adjustments that would be made. And that, that was on, if you can look at your own letter, I'm not getting into that uh, uh, item question two, and then point B. So um, I just thank them for, for, um, putting in an opinion. And I think that uh, with negotiations and things coming up, we have to be uh, kind of all try to work as what we can on the same page. But, you know, we're all elected officials here, except for Matt. And, uh, um, you know, we represent the people we represent. And that's everybody, uh, every stakeholder, every kid, everybody. So um, those are kind of my comments. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Anyone else have a comment or a question? <laughs> I have a couple of thoughts. I'm going to try to organize in my head here. Um, if the line item is presented as is, I will be voting to support it. Um, I too heard all those comments. We had a two hour discussion last week. Unfortunately, no one attended that. So they didn't hear our thorough discussion about this issue specifically. Um, and I think the phrase I used last week was this was the least worst option presented to us in that the administration specifically, Mr. Jelano was presented with an option to make some reductions at the middle school. And in his estimation, I certainly don't want to speak for him, but he's been on record several times. This was the way to approach it that still allowed the most choice. Because if we don't go this path, particularly or per, possibly electives or other programming at the middle school might be taken away. And I know study hall was a, an issue. Um, and part of this longer runway, as Dr. Hillman put it, is allow, allowing for them to have time to develop a more thorough plan, which is what I believe the 
union leadership from the middle school was alluding to here not to not move ahead with this but to allow for a longer um time period that was my understanding of the letter that jeff just referenced um i am supportive of this i think it is <clears throat> the smart fiscal way to do it i realize any change is difficult uh if we had a list of 30 different items in front of us last month we'd be hearing about those programs as well and certainly everyone has to vote their conscience on these things um regarding the change there's other schools that have six period days block days so of course particularly if you're at the middle school now as a sixth grader or seventh grader you're going to be affected by a significant change but i have the fullest faith in the administration and the staff at the middle school that they can execute this in a way that would be no different to students other than knowing that they arrive at different times and go to the next class at different times also considering the period links i just think that's more of an operational issue than an advisory role from the board i don't know anything about scheduling education is not my background i feel like that's the responsibility responsibility of the administrators to set schedules i have to take the administrators views on this as the experts in the buildings who've spent their lives in education certainly families matter certainly the students opinions matter and i i'm going to have a middle schooler next year so i've thought about this long and hard but i'm not in the building every day and i have to trust that the principals in this case, Mr. Jelno knows what he's talking about. And I do. I do believe that. Um, and, and I do have some shared concern about loss of study hall for those students who take advantage of it. I don't recall the percentage, but I felt like it wasn't an extremely high number. And from those students that we've heard from who did speak in favor of changes, because there were some people who shared um, communication that they were okay with the change, that they'd find other alternatives, particularly if they have an advisory period or built-in time, which is what this additional time will allow for. I agree that trying to ramp this up this year was probably premature. So as I said, I will be voting for this if this is the way it comes, and it sounds like it will be. So I will be a yes vote. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Robert. Well, I I really um, appreciate Corey's comments and and am very much in agreement with them. I we are a district that that thoughtfully plans and and carefully executes um, by allowing our staff at the middle, and if by allowing our staff at the middle school to take an extra year to work through this, this change from a six period day, uh, we see a better result, I will, I support that. Um, the middle school administration has, they have been clear that this, this schedule reduction is being done strictly as a financial decision. But there are districts that that have six period days or even block schedules. Um, I went through both as as a student, uh, and they do this for academic reasons. If we move ahead, I I hope we are able to reframe how how we're looking at this and see that there see what the possibilities might be. Um, opportunities for an advising period, fewer transition times. Um, slightly longer classes in subjects like science. Uh, even, even though it delays the cost savings, if a year-long delay helps us end up with a better result, I, um, I, support, I support that. I think. Thank you, Robert. Anyone else? Good. All right. Um, I appreciate all the comments made. And um, I, I am really fond of the update, and that is that um, we are going to give our administration time to think through some of those choices and um, the logistics of it. Um, and, and again, like others have said, just putting my trust that this proposal wouldn't come forward if it was not good for kids. That's all I have to say about that. Are there any other final comments or questions on this item? Okay. Seeing no further discussion, I will take a motion. You can, um, as Dr. Hillman was explaining earlier, you can move for the item to be reduced as presented or reduced with new conditions. Is there a motion from one of the members on item line at 21? Okay, Robert, would you like to make a motion? I will move that we uh, approve the, the item as presented. As presented, okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second by Corey. All those in favor of reducing line item 21 as presented, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Anita, would you like to take a roll call vote? 
Butler? Aye. Coleman? Aye. Kerwitz? Uh, um, nay. 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 Gonzalez George? Aye. Miller? Aye. Nelson? Nay. Quinnell? Nay. Okay, the motion passes. We're on to line item 24. That is the change in the Amistadis uh, program. Is there any discussion on line 24? Any comments or questions? Okay, Ben. So just to reiterate, and obviously there was a dependency between the 21 and 24. So uh, updating 24 would likely be necessary in order to make it not contingent on right the six period date this year. Just I just want to state that for you. make sure my understanding is correct. Yeah. So what what Greg shared earlier is that I think that adding just being specific about adding in the 24, 25 uh, school year or when the school shifts to a six period day, that uh, addition to the motion would be appropriate. Okay, any other questions or comments on this item 24? Okay, seeing no further discussion, I'll take a motion. Okay, Corey. Let's see, I motion line number 24 with the amendment that it be uh, executed in school year 24 25. Okay, is there a second? Okay, second by Robert. All those in favor of seeing line item 24 updated to take uh, to be implemented in school year to be implemented in school year 23-24 to be implemented in school year 24-25. Say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion passes. Yeah, I think it was just providing greater specificity um, to match the same language as the previous line item. Good, thank you. Nita, do you have what you need there? Mm-hmm. We are on item C, the budget prioritization, prioritization of district services package. Are there any specific items that board members would like to remove for separate consideration? I'll ask two more times. Are there any specific items that board members would like to remove for separate consideration? Any items board members would like to remove? Okay, seeing not, none, I will take a motion to approve the district services reduction budget package as presented. Moved by Jenny, second by Ben. Is there any discussion on this item? Okay. All those in favor of approving the district budget reduction package as presented say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, passes. Thank you very much for your participation, all your comments and questions and, um, and the passion that you put forward on, on this budget reduction. We are on item D and that is the policy recommendations. I will take a motion and then we'll hear from Dr. Hellman. Is there a motion to approve the policy committee's recommended updates to policy 203 and 902? Moved by Robert. Second. Second by Corey. Okay, Dr. Hellman, would you like to give us a uh, I, we discussed this at the last board meeting and highlighted the uh, different changes. And so I would certainly answer any questions that people have had uh, since then, um, but I don't have anything to add from the last time. Okay, any questions or comments from the board members? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor of update, all those in favor of Approving the policy committee's recommended updates to policy 203 and 902, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion passes. All right. Item number eight, items for information. Director Finance Val and Superintendent Hillman will now um, share an updated transportation reduction option based on the discussion from our April, April 3rd work session. 
So I'm going to have Val talk about the, uh, there were some additional options. Be clear, there's no vote on transportation issues tonight. This was a budget target that was approved as part of last year's budget reduction, reduction process. As you've heard, uh, Val and Benjamin Buss have spent months at looking at uh, additional efficiencies. We've shared the concept of a fee uh, for some students who are currently receiving transportation but aren't necessarily guaranteed it under state law. So based on discussion at the work session, Val is bringing forward just some other thoughts, and we'd like to open up uh, for additional discussion about this item. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions or comments board members want to make? Do you want me to summarize the, the additions first? Okay. Um, so on the document in your packet, uh, what I heard um, in the work session was, is there a nominal fee or what is what could that look like where we're not going to the full 350, um, but what are some alternative um, levels that we could look at? So in the packet, um, I did do um, a calculation for a $75 annual fee, 100, 200, 300, and 350, just so you can see the range. I did estimate that we would receive roughly 75% of uh, the total amount of available just because we know we would not charge any families that qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, so $75 would be about $61,000. Um, certainly better than zero, but there is um, certainly an administrative impact to this recommendation um, that I just need the board to be aware of. Um, we'll need to have a process to have people pay, to keep track of it, to make sure that students that are riding the bus um, paid the fee and that sort of thing. So there is kind of a, um, there is a process to this and what that will take. I'm not 100% sure right at this moment, but I just wanna keep that um, as part of the conversation. Um, in addition, we did talk to the city um, and because one of the concerns or recommendations that Benjamin Buss had was connecting Aspen Street um, and Southbridge Drive, which would make the um, southeast section um, of Northfield uh, walkable to the middle school. And that path actually is completed, um, but currently, um, depending on construction schedules, would not um, make that area walkable yet due to the level of construction, it wouldn't be safe for students to be walking on that just yet, um, but that is in place. And so that is a, an option in the future to help reduce uh, transportation in that area. Um, so that's the summary I had, but certainly any questions or conversations. Okay, Amy. I'm just wondering if that path is in place I mean, we can't require that people use it, but I think a lot of people will just start using it despite the construction because they need to get to school or get home from school or whatever. So I just wanted to put that out there that um, we need to make sure there's a safe way for those kids to mm -hmm. then cross the street and get to whatever school they're going to. Yeah, at, at this point, I think Benjamin Buss's recommendation would be to still transport students in that area rather than requiring them to walk until the construction is complete. Anyone else? Ben? Thanks, Al. That's helpful. Yeah, during that work session, I, I know we were talking about the fee is in some way to get a better sense of ridership as well. You know, and I think we've heard appropriate concerns in the community just in terms of safe routes to school and walking and, you know, different, what's appropriate for different age groups. Right. And just personally looking at the numbers, as you said, trying to get to cover that three hundred and fifty thousand dollars through rider revenue, or yeah, essentially rider fees would be, yeah, wouldn't work for a whole variety of reasons, like we've talked about. But um, is that how much of route planning right now is a function of people that say they're going to ride and maybe end up not really riding? Do you have a good sense of that from? Um, I don't have a good sense of what percentage that might be. I know there's a lot. Um, they they certainly take in the forms that they get, but there's always the assumption or concern that students who were riding last year are likely going to ride again. Um, 
And so I know there's a lot of um, shuffling in the first couple of weeks of school once we see we see it in our buildings too. There's students that moved and didn't tell us, or you know, there's all kinds of scenarios that can take place. But I don't, I couldn't give you a percentage off the top of my head um, of what that impact might be, but we're hopeful that it'll be significant. Then just an additional question you talked about just administration of you know setting up a program where you're having to collect and monitor fees. Do you have at least a sense in terms of you know how many hours that might be in a fiscal year? for any current or potential new position? Um, it would, it would, I wouldn't anticipate a new position. That's, I wouldn't make the recommendation just because the um, cost offset wouldn't make sense. But that's certainly something that we would work with Benjamin Bassan um, in terms of setting up a feast. We have an online system already that would be easy um, to set up to have the option for family. Is that part I'm not very concerned about. It's more the um, reconciliation of who's actually riding and had they paid the fee and the follow-up just to make sure that that's happening. Um, I would say that's, I would envision it being sort of a snapshot method where it's not like every week we're going to say who's on the bus this week and try and track it down. That that in my mind does not make make good sense, but you know, saying by the third week of school, who's writing regularly and following up just to say, hey, there's this process and, um, you know, do you need assistance on the fee? And, you know, just reaching out in that way. I would imagine um, the workload would be heavy in the fall <laughs> um, and much less throughout the rest of the year. It would be pretty intermittent. Um, I see that with transportation in general. I, I see a um, heavier call volume and email volume in the fall when new routes are being established and new routines, and then it kind of, um, everybody gets in the groove. So I would imagine it'd be a little heavy in September and October, but then we would be in a pretty good place. Um, I don't have a good sense on total hours, but I do feel confident that my current staff could manage it. And then one last question. So if the board were to take action on this, you know, at a future meeting, would it be, how difficult do you think it would be to get, you know, something set up in order to do this in terms of a fee collection piece? Is that feasible for this fall or? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Yep. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Val. And I just want to emphasize, you know, we continue to hear from folks uh, about their, you know, valid concerns about changes to transportation. So, the reason that we extricated this from the budget reductions tonight is to make sure that we can have the board focus on the transportation component independently so that we still can hear from constituents about how they feel about some of these transportation uh, potential changes. And just to reiterate, there are some things that just make you know good sense for us to implement, like the opt-in transportation, uh, whether or not we use to fee that opt-in piece um, and some of those other efficiencies, while there aren't as many as we would like. Many school districts who are looking at trying to create transportation efficiencies are moving to things that we have been doing for close to 20 years already, right? So we have long been a very efficient transportation system, which is why getting to that dollar figure is much more difficult than any of us thought it would be. So we appreciate the board and the communities weighing in on this. We know that there are some um, consequences if we change ridership. We understand that more people will drive students to school uh, we want, we actually would love it if more kids took the bus, right? We know it's the safest way for kids to get to school. So this is a complicated issue and we just want to make sure it has its own independent opportunity for discussion. So if you have further questions between now and the time we meet at the next board meeting, we're not even planning to ask you to vote on it at the next board meeting. It'll be most likely in May um, when we formalize a final recommendation for you. So we just, we need to hear from people. We need you to be giving us some feedback about what kind of recommendations you would like us to consider bringing forward. And if not, we'll, we'll find another way to address this. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Item number nine is our future meetings. They are at 6 PM here in the district boardroom. They are Monday, April 24th, May 8th, and May 22nd, all Mondays. Um, that is all the business that we have for tonight. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? By Jeff. Second. By Robert. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. We're adjourned. Okay.